morning, everyone. Hope you can hear me. Um, it's uh, Mother's Day, as we all heard, and it's uh, really exciting. I almost forgot about uh, Mother's Day, and it was the kids who reminded me that, you know, hey, it's Mother's Day, so we need to get something for the mothers. So uh, eventually, yesterday, I went and got some uh, flowers, and we, we hid it. We kept it safe. But, you know, uh, the mothers, they know everything that's happening in the house. And they uh, find out that I got the flowers. So, you know, there's usually a saying, moms know everything. And it's, uh, it's so true. So I was just thinking about it, how wonderful and blessed we are uh, to have wonderful God-fearing uh, mothers. Uh, and that's uh, a blessing to all of us. This morning, uh, the thought that was laid upon my heart uh, was uh, uh, an incident that happened in scripture. And uh, I was thinking what, to, what, what should be the topic. And uh, the Lord brought in a very interesting uh, thought. Uh, I played uh, chess with uh, the God of Philistines. And that's when this whole thing came checkmate. Now for many of the youngsters, uh, you know, chess has, I think chess game has kind of died out a bit. It's not very familiar. Now we have more uh, high-tech video games. But uh, in our times, you know, in my time kind of a thing, uh, chess game was something pretty interesting. So we have a, a team on one side and we have a team on the other side. It's uh, the black, um, mostly colors are black and white. So it's a team between the black and white. And the whole game is where you corner the king and the king, uh, which uh, you can see here in this uh, picture, is fallen down now because the king has been knocked off. And the moment the ch king is cornered, basically the game is over. And, that, and at that point, you say, checkmate. That means uh, it's done. You can't move anymore. The game is over. The opponent has won the game. So that's what a uh, chess game is all about. Uh, we will go into that as we see and uh, what the Lord has laid upon our hearts. Um, now, moving on, uh, oops. Not sure why it's not, okay. Oh, so I just got a little delay. Okay, uh, Vishwanand Anand, uh, he's a world chess grandmaster player, uh, one of the highest IQs. Uh, he's a little old now, but uh, India was pretty much on the top uh, with the chess game uh, for quite a long time. Uh, so it's an interesting game uh, to see. Now, what I wanted to say in Checkmate is, um, we are all, today also in our worship time, we were thinking about it, you know, in this lockdown period, um, what is God trying to really do? God, We know God is not quiet. Uh, God is in action. He's doing something. And the thought that came to me is, God is cornering us on in, in our individual lives and cornering us and saying, checkmate. I'm cornering you right now. I'm cornering each one right now because I want to talk to you guys something personal. I want your attention. And God speaks through us through scriptures. God speaks through us through circumstances, which is this lockdown period. And not just to us, also to the unbelievers. So everyone is being locked down in a same platform, same situation, and God is speaking to each one of us. And uh, sometimes he speaks to us through parents and sometimes also through children. Moving on, what we're gonna cover today uh, is checkmate. One of the situations that we find ourselves in is we are lukewarm believers. You know, we're very shallow and God is taking this opportunity to sit personally with us and say, are you a lukewarm believer in my sight? You know, we need to discuss this. Now, that's one side of it. Another side of the checkmate is to unbelievers. You know, um, also to unbelievers, God is saying, hey, I am in control. No matter what happens, I am still God, the living God, and I'm in total control. The third part of the checkmate is for backsliders. And God is speaking to them and saying, are you backsliding? You know, when situations come your way, when the problems come your way, are you going to walk away from me? Because I'm still in control. The next part is 
checkmate to believers and people who are really active uh, serving the lord faithfully still god has also put them also in lockdown and god is saying i want to talk to you i want to talk to you something personal and then we see the last part where god really moves now all of this the key theme verse what i wanted to share is james chapter 2 uh, sorry james chapter 1 verse 2 to 4 and we see it on the screen consider it pure joy not just joy uh, in some versions it's all joy consider it pure joy my brothers or brethren brothers and sisters whenever you face trials of many kinds and one of the trials or situation is the lockdown because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance or endurance or builds a character and perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. This is God's plan for each one of us. When we go through these situations, when we go through these trials, these difficult times, God is testing our faith. Are we lukewarm believers? Unbelievers doesn't come into the picture, but I'll be touching on it. Are we backsliders at certain situations? As believers, what does God want us to rejuvenate in ourselves? And then God is going to show us what the next step is. Now, when I put all these terms, it's based on an incident that happened in Scripture. And that's how I placed these five points. And let's uh, deep dive to see what it says. Uh, let's read from 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse uh, 1 to 18. And uh, it goes on. We will be covering from chapter 4 to chapter 7. Uh, as the Lord leads, and if uh, time permits, uh, we can read it in detail. So we'll read the first part. It's on the screen. Those, those who can see clearly, definitely you can go to the scriptures in the Bible. First Samuel chapter 4, verse 1 to 80. And the word of Samuel came to all, word of the Lord, uh, sorry, the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now Israel went out to battle against Philistines. They encamped at Ebenezer. And the Philistines encamped at Aphek. The Philistines drew up in line against Israel. And when the battle spread, Israel was defeated before the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 men on the field of battle. And when the people came to the camp, the elders of Israel said, why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? Let us bring the Ark of the Covenant um, of the Lord here from Shiloh. Uh, keep the word Shiloh in your mind because we'll be dwelling on it quite a bit. Shiloh, that it may come among us and save us from the power of our enemies. So the people sent to Shiloh and brought from there the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of Hosts, who is enthroned on the cherubim. In other uh, versions, the good version says uh, above the cherubim. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. As soon as the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel gave a mighty shout so that the earth was sounded or echoed. And when the Philistines heard the noise of the shouting, they said, what does this great shouting in the camp of the Hebrews mean? And when they learned that the Ark of the Lord had come to the camp, the Philistines were afraid. For they said, a God has come into the camp. And they said, woe to us, for nothing like this has happened before. Woe to us. Who can deliver us from the power of these mighty gods? Uh, keep in mind here it says mighty gods. It's in plural. Uh, in the chapters ahead, you will see the Philistines coming to the knowledge of God and saying, not mighty gods, but one God. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, it's, uh, continuing. These are the gods who struck the Egyptians with every sort of plague in the wilderness. Take courage and be men, O Philistines, let you be, uh, lest you become slaves to the Hebrews, as they have been to you, be men and fight. Okay, so continuing on. So the Philistines fought, and Israel was defeated, and they fled every man to his home. And there was a very great slaughter, for 30,000 foot soldiers of Israel fell, and the ark of God was captured, and the two sons of 
Eli, Hophni and Phinehas died. Now keep in mind, um, we just read 4,000 people died, and here we see another 30,000 people dying. So it's in total 34,000 people of the Israel soldiers collapsed in a few days. Moving on, a man of Benjamin ran from the battle line and came to Shiloh the same day with his clothes torn and with dirt on his head. Just to pause, this man of Benjamin that's mentioned here, uh, the Jews believe it was Saul, the first uh, king of Israel. Uh, continuing verse 13, when he arrived, Eli was sitting on his seat by the roads watching and for his heart trembled for the ark of God. And when the man came into the city and told the news, all the city cried, cried out. When Eli heard the sound of the outcry, he said, what is this uproar? Then the man hurried and came and told Eli. Now, Eli was 98 years old and his eyes were set on that he could not see. And the man said to Eli, I am he who has come from the battle. I fled from the battle today. And he said, how did it go, my son? He who brought the news answered and said, Israel has fled before the Philistines. And there has also been a great defeat among the people. Your two sons also, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead. And the ark of God has been captured. As soon as he mentioned the ark of God, Eli fell over backward from his seat by the side of the gate. And his neck was broken and he died. For the man was old and heavy and he had judged Israel 40 years. May the Lord um, bless us with this reading. Uh, we have just read the first part of it. I hope and pray that I'll be able to read some more uh, as time permits. Moving on, uh, I want to focus on Shiloh. Um, Shiloh is a place very special. Um, in ancient Canaanite, this was the central capital city. And in this city, all the Canaanite gods were there. This was a place where they would all come to worship their God. When God brought Israel out of Egypt from slavery, of course, they surround, uh, roamed around for 40 years, and finally they crossed the river Jordan with Joshua and Caleb. They come in. God said, go to Shiloh. And Shiloh was completely destroyed of all the gods, and the tabernacle, for, which was uh, a pilgrim tabernacle that was a tent was finally placed in Shiloh. Now I will show you some interesting things about Shiloh. And in Shiloh, they started building the walls also for the tabernacle. So it was almost a, almost a finalized spot for the temple. It was not Jerusalem. Keep that in mind. The capital of uh, Israel is Jerusalem, which we see today. But the first choice God had for the capital of Israel was not Jerusalem. It was Shiloh, and that's interesting. This temple stood there for 369 years, uh, plus another 20 years. As we read the scriptures, we'll see that. So it's almost 400 years this temple stood there. But after the time of Hophni and Phinehas, and they died, and the uh, ark was uh, captured, we see uh, archaeologists, it's not written in the scripture, but archaeologists and the theologians confirm you know, um, the uh, Philistines defeated the Israelites in the war. Uh, 30,000 people died. And they, archaeologists find that the Philistines came into Shiloh, killed the people there. So that might be another 50,000 to 100,000. And came to Shiloh, the right place where the temple is, and destroyed it to the floor. And, and interestingly, we will see that place has never been touched to this day. And we're going to see some pictures about it. And that's when the temple place from Shiloh was moved to Jerusalem. Why did all this happen? There's some interesting things. Uh, before we go, I'll uh, show you some uh, nice uh, pictures. So this is Shiloh. Uh, this is um, uh, uh, from uh, what is satellite picture. Uh, it's covered by mountains on all, not mountains, hills from all the sites. And if I, if you see the red mark, you'll see a tiny spot uh, where Shiloh is, the, uh, the, where the temple of God is placed. Uh, another picture. You see, this is the true thing. You'll see hills on all the sites. So when the people came to worship, after they sacrificed, they sat around on the hills 
and when the final passover everything was done and the horn blew they broke uh, they ate the sacrifice food and uh, broke the potteries in which they ate left all the potteries there and they went home so one side of the hill which is facing towards uh, uh, Shiloh, the temple has all these broken potteries even to this day now when archaeologists are saying it's tons and tons of them because the people about two million people used to gather from all over israel to worship another picture it's getting closer you see that's the point where the temple uh, they have identified the archaeologists have found now uh, getting closer so they have dug so much and they see this is where the original temple stood now the beauty of this uh, place this part of the shiloh god had prepared is it's exactly 25 meters by 50 meters a perfect rectangle this was the perfect spot god had created just to put the the, the tabernacle but the people disobeyed and walked away from god um a closer picture uh, this uh, arrow which i showed that's the spot where uh, hannah knelt down and prayed and uh, received samuel uh, what a beautiful thing uh, i long to go to israel and to see that place and you know just uh, just enjoy that beauty of it um and here we see this was the temple we see that the holy place the most holy place the ark has been taken out of here it was taken to war which should have never happened they broke the law and they did it uh, i shouldn't say broke the law they did not do what was right in the sight of god they took it and now the ark has been captured by philistines and it's with them moving up um, i'm showing you the map now uh, now if you see on your right hand side you see shiloh uh, it's about 45 kilometers to ebenezer and apec is there so right there is where they had the big war and we see uh, Saul running back all the way to Shiloh, 45 kilometers, just to let Eli know that this is what happened. Anyways, then from there, we see the arrow that takes you all the way down on the left hand side, right at the bottom. I'll see if I can put out the mark here Ashot. This is where the, temp, uh, the first spot where the, uh, the ark comes and settles down. And then we are going to see what and all happens there. So um, getting back to our point, checkmate. God is asking us, are we lukewarm believers? And why do we say that? What do we get out of it? Um, I'm going to read that passage it's on the screen. To the angel of the church, church in Laodicea write, these are the words of the amen, the faithful and the true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. The Lord is very upset. You say I'm rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need anything. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich and white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so that you can see those whom i love i rebuke and discipline so be earnest and repent this lockdown period is a time where god is saying i am here to spend some quality time with each one of us and say you know, build us up and that's why it says, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, pure joy, because you know that the testing of your faith, that word testing of your faith is the same as refined in the fire, which I highlighted in red, refined in fire, the same word, Greek word is used. So that develops perseverance and perseverance must finish its work. Stay strong. When I'm taking you through this rough time, stay strong. Don't be a lukewarm because I want you to be mature and complete and not lacking anything. Um, you know, um, some of us uh, in, in this difficult time are going through sickness. Some of us are fa facing financial crisis. Some of us are having family issues, loss of dear ones, and such a sorrowful time that we've been, uh, we completely understand that. But at the same time, 
God is also taking this opportunity to talk to us and saying, are we really lukewarm? You know, um, Shiloh was a place uh, that God had chosen the temple should be permanent. But the Israelites kept on sinning. We read in the book of Judges too, they everybody did what was right in their eyes, evil over evil over, and God got sick and tired of it. And he said, enough of it. You know, uh, he doesn't care about this spot or this church or this is my place and it has to be. If we are within ourselves a lukewarm, God gets upset about it because he wants to work with us and it's not the buildings or the walls that God really looks at. Now, um, another uh, thing about uh, as we move on is, you know, this uh, Shiloh was also uh, in Samaria uh, and, um, uh, you know, it was also a military uh, capital too. And uh, another thing, uh, what we can see here is um, it, the first time Shalom was uh, mentioned was also in Genesis chapter 49, verse 10. It's prophesied there. And uh, we see uh, the Lord dealing uh, very uniquely. Now, you know, uh, God is, you know, when we say our, um, you know, when we say, uh, are we lukewarms? God is asking us, are we using our time, our energy and our money the right way? You know, are we just being casual about it? You know, whenever if I have a little money, okay, I'll give. Otherwise, I won't. Are we being sacrificial about what we're doing? Um, are we focused on earthly things more than heavenly things? Um, are we uh, willing to go through that fire, that refined fire, so that uh, God can make us uh, special and holy uh, in His sight? Now, uh, the second uh, part we are going to is God has dealt with the first people, group of people which are like lukewarms and God is saying, fine, now I'm going to deal with the second set of people in this situation. Now, why I picked up this chapter also is it is a situation where Philistines are going through a severe pandemic situation, very similar to what we are having today, almost like a coronavirus situation. Uh, there's rats uh, that come out and they bite or uh, disease is transferred, and the people in Philistines are all getting huge tumors, which are like huge lumps on their hands and their body and feet, and people don't know what's happening, and people are dying, and nobody knows what's happening. And this is where it comes to 1 Samuel chapter 5. Now, uh, we'll read that part. When the Philistines captured the ark, they brought it from Ebenezer to Ashur. Uh, now, in Philistines, uh, there was five big cities. One was Ashdod, second one was Gath, third was Ekron, fourth was Ashkelon, and fifth was Gaza. So we will see uh, all these five cities. So these are the five warlords also that was there from the Philistines. And uh, when we look at the map, I'll show it to you. And okay, moving on to verse two. Then the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it into the house of Dagon and set it up beside Dagon. Um, and when the people of Asher rose early in the next day, behold, Dagon had fallen down, uh, face downward onto the ground before the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and put him back in his place. But when they rose early on the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen face downward on the ground before the ark of the Lord and the head of Dagon, both his hands were lying cut off to the threshold. Only the trunk of Dagon was left to him. This, this is why the priests of Dagon and all who enter the house of Dagon do not tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashur to this day. Uh, moving on. And the hand of the Lord was heavy against the people of Ashur, and he terrified and afflicted them with tumors, both Ashur and his territory. And when the men of Ashur saw how things were, they said, the ark of God of Israel must not remain with us, for his hand is hard against us and against Dagon, our God. So they sent and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, what shall we do with the ark of God of Israel? And they said, let the ark of God of Israel be brought around to Gath. Uh, keep this word. From Ashod, it went to Gath. And it's very important why it went to Gath. We will look at it. And they brought the ark of God of Israel there. But after they had brought it there, the hand of the Lord was against the city, causing a great panic. And he afflicted the men of the city, both young and old, so that tumors broke out of them. 
So they sent the Ark of God to Ekron. But as soon as the Ark of God came to Ekron, the people of Ekron cried out, they have brought around us the Ark of God of Israel to kill us and our people. They said, therefore, and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, send away the Ark of God of Israel and let it return to its place that it may not kill us or our people. And there was a deadly panic throughout the whole city. The hand of God was very heavy there. The men who did not die were struck with tumor and the cry of the city went up into heaven. So we see now here, uh, Dagon. Uh, this was a, it was in the shape of a fish. You know, the mermaid stories that you see is all from these gods. So uh, this was the Dagon God that they had. This is, uh, how do we know this, this is what it looks like? The, in the middle picture you see, this is from one of the coins that was uh, excavated by the archaeologists. So you'll see that that's how they built this thing. Now, the Israelites fought with Philistines, but Israelites lo lost 34,000 plus other people who died altogether about, say, 50,000, say about 80,000 to 100,000 people died in Israel. But the Ark of God was with the Philistines. Now, when the Philistines saw the Ark of God with them, they thought, the God of Israel was defeated, but God of Israel was not defeated. You see, he was brought into the temple of Dagon and Dagon falls there. You see, this is where I pick, picked up that checkmate. God is making a checkmate with the God of Philistine. The Philistine God falls down. They pull him up, put him back again, it falls down into utter pieces. A checkmate again. This is a real chess game right there. And the Philistines don't know what's happening. The tumors are breaking. Everything is going out of control. The Lord is meeting with Philistines. Did Israel go to attack Philistines now? No. God himself said, fine, I've taken care of the uh, lukewarm believers. Now I'm going to deal with the unbelievers too. And here, easily 50 to another 100,000 would have died. We don't know the exact numbers, but it was a pretty nasty scene there and people died nobody have to go and stand for god god knows how to take care of himself now from here we read from ashur it goes to gath why does it have to go to gath um uh, before we go i'll show you some more interesting thing um canon sama is a goddess of mercy in okinawa japan and 2018 there was a, a big uh, uh, typh uh, a typhoon that came, Trami, and it bro brought down this whole idol down. And kind of similar to what Dagon is, that fish god uh, crashed. Uh, just wanted to show you that. Uh, so uh, when we come, so we see that God deals with lukewarm believers. Then he deals with unbelievers. Now I'm coming to a point of backsliders. Why does it say, why do they come to the backsliders? Now from Ashur, the Ark of God goes to Gath. Why did God choose the Ark of God to go to Gath? Now, if you take a step back in the story of uh, Naomi, Ruth and Orpha. Orpha, we see, didn't want to go to Bethlehem and, or to Israel. She walked away from God and uh, she was returning back to Moab. And we remember the story where yeah, she met with the Philistine soldiers and she came and settled in the city of Gath. You see, uh, how do we can confirm that Goliath is from the city of Gath. And so we know Orpha is there. God goes to meet Orpha. She has backslidden. She has uh, renounced her faith. She's walked away from God, but God gives her another chance. And, and uh, God himself visits Gath. And we see that people are scared. What are we going to do about this? And, you know, um, and there's again, the death, the tumor is going on and utter confusion. Um, and still Orpha doesn't make it. Is it in the scriptures? It's not in the scriptures. But as we understand the background, we get to see. God is meeting even the backsliders. In Hebrews chapter six, verse six, it says, and they have fallen away to restore them again to repentance, since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. The moment you backslide, the scripture says you're almost like 
crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm, to their self-harm, and holding him up to contempt. And this is what happens. Now, uh, we see similar situation in the case of uh, uh, Judas, Judas Iscariot. Uh, Jesus took him along with him, but he chose to backslide. Jesus taught him the same way he taught all the disciples, but he chose to uh, backslide. Uh, Jesus Christ gave him a checkmate several times and said, I'm talking to you straight. Stop this. God, Jesus even gave him the authority of having the, uh, uh, to be responsible for all the money uh, that they earned uh, or, uh, you know, to give to the poor or whatever they needed among the disciples. He was in charge. There also he messed up. Everywhere, God was putting a checkmate. And people sometimes walk away. This pandemic time also is could be a time there might be some backsliders. There might be some people who are trying to just trying to crucify the Son of God again. And, you know, are we in any of those categories? Let us examine ourselves. In Zechariah 1 verse 3, it says, therefore, tell the people, this is what the Lord Almighty, Almighty says, return to me, declares the Lord Almighty, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. Again, coming back to James chapter 2 verse 4. Count, consider it all pure joy. When you are being tested in your faith, are you deciding to stand strong, go through the situation in faith because God is making us mature and complete, or are we going to backslide? Are we going to turn our backs to him? Um, I can show you the picture. So from here, um, we see after the war, it comes to Ashod. From Ashod, it goes to Gath. From Gath, it goes to Ekron. And from Ekron, finally, they say enough is enough. And they want to send the ark back into Israel. And that's a blue one, which goes to Beth Shemesh. Now, a uh, quick question. We have Ashod, Gath, and Ekron. Why didn't the, um, the, it's never mentioned that the ark of God touched Ashkelon or Gaza. Why was that? Now, it's very interesting. Ashkelon was the place where Delilah, cut the hair of Samson. And then from there, so there was no temple there. And from there, Samson, whose eyes were blinded, was taken to Gaza. Gaza had a big temple that of Dagon. And that's where he was brought. And then he pulled down the pillars, 3,000 people died. Because of that, the Gaza temple was completely destroyed. The Philistines did not take the ark to Gaza because Gaza temple was completely destroyed. We see that God had already dealt with Gaza, so he didn't visit Gaza anymore. He went to Gath and finally to the third city, Ekron. And now, uh, now we see some more interesting things that happens. Now in chapter six, uh, I think we're going in good speed. Uh, in chapter six, now we come to the uh, inter in further interesting part. The ark of the Lord was in the country of Philistines seven months. And the Philistines called for the priests and the diviners and said, what shall we do with the ark of the Lord? Tell us with what we shall send it back to its place. They said, if you will send away the ark of God of Israel, do not send it empty, but by all means return him a guilt offering. Then you will be healed and it will be known to you why his hand does not turn away from you. They said, what is the guilt offering that we should turn? And they answered, five golden tumors and five golden mice. And from this, we know it, the whole disease was from the mice and the tumors. According to the number of the lords of Philistines, for the same plague was on all of you and all your lords. So you must make images of the tumors and images of your mice that ravage the land and give the glory to the God of Israel. Remember in the... For chapter 4, it was said, these gods of Israel. But now they have seen the God, the true God of Israel. And they said, the God of Israel. Perhaps, and continuing on, sorry. Perhaps he will lighten his hand from off you and your gods and your land. Why should you harden your hearts as the Egyptians and the Pharaohs harden their hearts? After he had dealt severely with them, did they not send the people away and they departed? Now then. Take and prepare a new cart with two milk cows on which there has never been a yoke and the yoke the, and yoke the cows to the cart. But take their calves 
home away from them and take the ark of the lord and place it on the cart and put in a box at its size the figure of gold figures of gold which you are returning to him as a guilt offering then send it off and let it go its way and watch if it goes up on the way to its own land to beth shemesh uh, keep the word beth shemesh in mind it's a very important city and uh, we'll be de dealing with that next then it is he who has done us this great harm but if it's not then we shall know that it is not his hand that struck us it happened to us by coincidence uh, we will read the remaining part of the scripture but just to give you a hand uh, a picture so the philistines finally decided to return the ark um, it was not the philistines god has visited the enemy camp uh, told them everything that he had to say uh, he's in control he attacked the philistines destroyed quite a bit of them he visited uh, orpha and gath also uh, called out to the backsliders and he's coming back now now <clears throat> what the philistines do usually on a cart you put bulls the male uh, uh, animals but here they put the female cows milking cows within uh, with their nursing uh, you know calves and they took the calves and put them in the house now what they're trying to test and see is usually a cow if its baby is taken out from uh, away from the cow the cow will not go anywhere else it will look for its baby what they're trying to do here is they're going to put two milking cows on this cart and send it back now they want to see if god is in control or will these cows return back to look for their calves and that's what is um, and that's what they're saying and here we, and we know for sure god was in control and led the uh, cows uh, right into back into israel uh, moving on as we continue in the scripture let's read the remaining part of the scripture the men did so and took two milk cows and yoked them to the cart and shut up their calves at home and they put the ark of god on the cart and the box of the golden mice and images of their tumors and the cows went straight into the direction of beth shemesh along one highway low lowing as they went they turned neither to the right nor to the left and the beth shem and the lords of philistines went after them as far as the border of beth shemesh now the people of beth shemesh were reaping their wheat a harvest in the valley and when they lifted up their eyes and saw the ark they rejoiced to see it the cart came into the field of joshua of beth shemesh and stopped there a great stone was there and they split up the wood of the cart and offered the cows as a burnt offering to the lord and the levites uh, uh, get the word levites and the levites took down the ark of the lord and the box that was beside it in which were the golden figures and set them upon the great stone and the men of beth shemesh offered burnt offerings and sacrifices on that day to the lord and when the five lords of the philistines saw it they returned that day to ekron these are the golden tumors that the philistines returned as a guilt offering to the lord one for ashur one for gaza one for ashkelon one for gath and one for ekron we know these are the five major cities and the golden mice according to the number of all the cities of the philistines belonging to the five lords both fortified cities and unwalled villages the great stone beside which they set down the ark of the lord is a witness to this day in the field of joshua beth shemes i will show you that picture soon uh, let's read the remaining part of the scripture and he struck now okay now there's another havoc that's happening now and he struck down some of the men of beth shemesh because they looked upon the ark of the lord he struck 70 men of them uh, here it says 70 men if you read uh, uh, compare uh, first chronicles uh, same in passage written there um, and it also says 50000 men too so it's 50000 plus 70 so it's 50070 uh, men that died there and the people mourned because the lord had struck the people with a great blow then the men of beth shemesh said who is able to stand before the lord this holy God, and to whom shall he go up away from? So they send the messages to the inhabitants of Kirajairam, saying, The Philistines have returned the ark of the Lord, come down and take it up to you. So we see now from Shiloh, it went all the way to Ashur, from Ashur to Gath, to Ekron, and finally to Beth Shemesh. Now, 
um, and I'll show you. This is the field uh, in Beth Shemesh, and this is the field of Joshua, and this is where the ark finally came and stood, and that's where they brought, uh, ripped out, uh, dismantled the whole ark and made it as a, a sacrifice there. Now, um, you know, the people were so happy. They worshipped, they brought, uh, they sacrificed these bulls, I mean, these cows to the Lord and thanked for bringing the ark of God. But they did one silly thing. They wanted to look inside the ark. So they slowly moved the lid and looked inside. And that's when 50,070 people died on the spot. Now, why did God have to be so tough on them? There was a reason. Beth Shemesh, that's why I said the word Beth Shemesh is very important. When Joshua uh, allotted the land, the Levites were allotted Beth Shemesh. So the Levites are people who knew the word of God who knew the importance of the ark of God. They knew they could not look into it. It was prohibited. Godly people who knew the word of God disobeyed and looked in. And God did not have mercy at that point of time. You know, when the Philistines took it all around Ashot, Gath, Ekron, nobody died because they touched the, the ark of God. But when it came to Levites, God dealt with them pretty severely. And what I want to say is, these are a checkmate for believers. God not only checkmates uh, lukewarm believers, God not only checkmates unbelievers, God not only checkmates backsliders, but he also checkmates believers. Now, do not move the throne of God from your lives. If these people move that the lid which was a throne because uh, the, on top of the lid was the two cherubims. And we read in the scripture in chapter four that God dwells. He comes down and his Shekinah glory comes there. And that was the part that they moved. What the message is, do not move the throne of God from your lives. When we accepted Christ, we said we accept him as Lord and Savior, Lord of our lives. Do we move him out of our lives, from the throne of our lives as believers? Many a times we do. I do that several times and God is warning us, do not do that because there will be consequences for that. When we go through tough times, don't lose heart. You know, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds because you know that the testing of your faith, when you're being tested, be careful and do not move the throne of God from our lives and try to run our own lives. Hand it over to him. As we go through these tough times, the testing of our faith stands strong because he is making us mature and complete, not lacking anything. That's what the scripture says, not lacking anything. So as believers, we need to be careful. Now, um, in Beth Shemesh, after this uh, 50,000 people died, uh, they also said, you know what, we can handle this. So they shifted uh, the, the ark to Korea. Jerem, and this is the spot where they came. Now, in, now here's the thing. The, when we read the next, I don't think we have time. We are almost there. In, when we read chapter 8, we'll read that in Korea, Jerem, the ark stayed for another 20 years until David moved it from Korea, Jerem, all the way to the city of David and finally to Jerusalem, to Mount Moriah. Um, the remains of the, you know, in Shiloh was grounded down by the Philistines. We read that in Shiloh. The parts of the temple were brought and kept in Gibeon. Uh, we also read that in the further scriptures. Uh, this is just for uh, us to know. I'm just uh, trying to finish quickly because we have time up. So the last part is God changed the history of Israel. When people sinned, when people were lukewarm believers, God gave enough and more warning, stop it, do not do evil. How Hophni was doing uh, unacceptable things as a high priest and God dealt with them severely. And God said, enough is enough. I don't want the temple, which I originally, the capital city of Israel, which was Shiloh, is no more going to be the capital city. I'm moving it. To another place. Does that happen in our lives? You know, uh, can situations like this happen? Yes, it can happen. 400 years, Shiloh 
was the center, the capital city. Then the temple was moved to Jerusalem. And there also it was only for another 400 years. After that, king of Babylon came and destroyed it. Then they rebuilt it. Then they did so much work on it. Again, after Jesus Christ's crucifixion, it was demolished again. And after another 2,000 years, now Israel is slowly getting back into shape. You see how severe it is. When things come in our lives, when situations come in our life, we have to be careful because we need to count it pure joy when we go through tough times, especially in this lockdown time. It's God is has facing with us one on one and making sure are we going to stand strong for him? Are we going to be lukewarm Christians? You know, uh, will we be lukewarm believers? Uh, God also deals with unbelievers. We don't have to worry about it. He also he deals with the backsliders. He deals with believers like he does with Beth Shemesh. Are we going to stand strong? Don't, don't unthrone him or dethrone him from our lives. Keep him as the center of our lives. And the Lord will continue to bless us as he uses us. And consider it pure joy, my brothers, um, uh, you know, uh, when we face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. I want you to remember one thing. The world, when they do things, they say checkmate and game is over. In other words, checkmate means game is over. That's it. You're done. But when God does a checkmate, when God sits with us, meets us face to face, actually the game just begins. He's began to work in us so that he can make us mature and complete and not lacking anything. And brothers and sisters, uh, let's always remember this lockdown time is a time where God is saying checkmate. I am dealing with each one of you personally. Will you look up to me? I, if you look back into history, 400 years, Shiloh was the center, but I wiped it out. 400 years, Jerusalem was the center. I wiped it out. And God is um, dealing very severely. We have to take our Christian life severely. Let us not be backsliders. Let us not be just lukewarm believers. Um, be careful and let us serve the Lord and be for his glory. And as the Lord takes us through it, that is, may God enable us to be mature and complete and not lacking anything. Uh, let's look up to the Lord in prayer and uh, for blessing of his word. Uh, loving, gracious Father, we thank you for this morning and thank you for enabling us to worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, though we could not um, break uh, um, um, bread and wine, but we, you know the circumstances and you, we thank you that our worship was acceptable in your eyes. Lord, we um, sat before your, uh, before your throne, before your feet, to listen to your word, what you have to tell us. Lord, you, and you are a very serious God. And Lord, in this lockdown period, help us not to slack behind, to just relax and not to um, take life seriously, our Christian life seriously, but take it as a time to examine our lives, to see if we are lukewarm believers, to see if we are backsliders in any shape or form. And Lord, help us to be believers who stand for you, for your word. And Lord, that we will never ever push you out of our hearts, never dethrone you, but always keep you as the center of our lives. And Lord, that you will bless us because you have a great purpose to make us mature and complete so that we will lack nothing and lord we pray during this lock time time that you will bless us and uh, strengthen us as we move this pilgrim journey and a day is coming soon at that trumpet call we shall be taken up to face, see you face to face and enjoy life with you forever what a joy what a blessing and lord we pray that you will bless us with you thank you jesus for listening to our prayer and bless each one of us according to our needs we ask this prayer in all humility in Jesus Christ, precious and holy. Amen. Amen.